everybody. Welcome to the Voxology Podcast. We are delighted to be with you today, this fine spring day at least. Uh, when we're recording, it is fine and it is spring. It's about uh, 48 degrees and That's sunny spring. here in Nashville. Well, we winter, we don't get much of winter, which is great. But when we do, we cancel school just on the drop of a hat. It's fascinating. <laughs> we were talking so we this had morning, the- my kids have a ski week coming up. And so oh. it's a whole week off that obviously adults don't get. But I was like, it doesn't snow here enough yeah. to ski. So I don't, I mean, it doesn't snow here, period. So it's yeah. weird. I don't know That's why fair. we. Well, you live close to, I mean, what, two hours to skiing? I'd rather have like, if they parsed it out and gave us a bunch of four day weekends or something mm. like that. But Well, it sounds like you should go to a school board. And use Dude, that don't three even minute get me started on the school board public session to kind of make your case there. That happened uh, this week. Anyway, what school board? Oh, yeah, that's a interesting cultural battleground. Anyway, <laughs> welcome to the Voxology Podcast. I want to remind you we're on YouTube as well. If you want to see the glorious faces that are attached to the not so glorious voices. Um, Anyway, we are delighted to be with you today. I've got some thank yous. I've been overdue the last several weeks uh, for some thank yous and some shout outs. So I want to get to those ASAP. ASAP. Oh, I want to thank Eric and Gail and Austin and Joy and Joseph and Michelle and Chris for coming on to uh, support either through uh, tithe.ly, tithely is what we call it, or Patreon. And um, and we are a crowdfunded 501c3 nonprofit, and so thank you for your kind and generous support. Part of the reason why we can be on YouTube um, is because of you. So thank you, uh, because we needed to get fancy equipment and and uh, all sorts of filters that to make our faces presentable. And um, and you can see that they're a- absolutely failing to do any of that, but. <laughs> So, so Timothy, how are you? How was your week? Anything good, good happened to you? Let's, we're, we're just going to start doing it. We're going to make you name good things that happened to you. Man, yep. it's always and good. And there's a long pause. I know. I wasn't, well, this was, this is unplanned. This is a, well, this is a surprise. You know, you know, uh, partially, I, I bet if I asked you to name bad things that happened, you wouldn't have to pause. You could, you wouldn't have to be prepped for that. Probably. What does that say about me? Just that you're great. <laughs> That's all. Uh, what well, good things happened this notice week? Notice the camera. He's looking around looking his around. room. Okay. I didn't realize uh, this was going to take 30 seconds Yep. to uh, get to. All right. Well, I'm sure mm-hmm, you'll think of it later. Still. So it's Super Bowl week, ladies and gentlemen. We're recording this the Friday before Super Bowl. It will be out the Monday after Super Bowl. And um, there's been a lot of news this week about uh, Jesus making an appearance in the Super Bowl. He's been making appearances all throughout the playoffs. And uh, he now gets spotlighted in a couple commercials in the Super Bowl. Awesome. uh, As part of a uh, campaign called He Gets Us. And so we got a question. Oh, you haven't seen these? No. Oh yeah, you're you're not really a football person. Yes. So so what what? Okay, I gotta explain this before we get to the question. Then, <laughs> for for the artists among us, um, Tim, thank you. You represent a segment of listenership that um, that I need to be reminded exists and is worth loving. The non footballers. And, <laughs> and uh, you you can have your baseball moments here. You know, next. This is my last week. Um, for football, but there are these commercials where, I mean, like one of the uh, more prevalent ones, and they're well shot, they're well executed, which is surprising, Um, but like uh, one will begin with a family, and it'll show pictures of them as they're young, and, you know, just a general read over, a voiceover of, hey, this family, you know, grew up together, they were tight, they faced hard times, blah, 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 and it's showing them as they get older, um, and then, you know, the narrator will say something like, yeah, but, you know, at some point they, they started having their own opinions and disagreeing. And um, after a while, they just stopped speaking to each other because they all insisted they had to be right. 
Um, and it's done gently. I mean, I'm not doing it justice. And then, and then it'll, it'll flash to a black screen with some print that, that said, you know, Jesus had disagreements with his family too. And then he, then it'll cut to, he gets us. And the us is like highlighted because then it goes Jesus and the us in Jesus is highlighted. So he okay. gets us. So Jesus, the us is highlighted in Jesus. That's the, oh. that's the kind of thing. So Jesus was an immigrant. Jesus um, disagreed with his family. Um, so, so, I mean, the, the heart, I mean, and, and hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't know if hundreds, but at least a hundred million well, for, dollars. Yeah, because Super Bowl ads are... Seven mil just right there. But all that is to say... Um, there, there has been lots of discussion in Christian circles about these, and we got a question this week about this whole campaign. Wait, who puts it on? Who is? Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a group. I don't know the group. Um, she might mention it, but, but let me just read the question, and then see where that takes us. Um, but there are loads of people writing about it and talking about it. Hmm. If you have a few minutes, can we talk about "He Gets Us," which is the name of this campaign? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I know you have lots of great topics on the podcast. So as I write this, I guess I'm pitching more than anything a topic I think would be interesting to cover. Uh, first, because I listened to the rise and fall of Mars Hill this past summer, I heard the pitch for this ad campaign over and over before it happened. So it didn't surprise me. So I had no idea this was coming. Uh, Mike Erie didn't have any idea. Nor did, nor does a group of evangelicals buying ad time for Jesus ever surprise me. It is so entirely aligned with everything I know about the evangelical psyche. While not surprising, it feels surreal to see people surprised by the ads. This sort of epitomizes the experience of having grown up uh, evangelical in America. It's the experience of both watching secular people puzzle over a public expression of evangelicalism and sincerely joining them in the puzzling, or rubbernecking may be a more accurate term, even while I can 100% imagine the boardroom conversation and the philanthropic pitches. Let's be honest, any of us who grew up evangelical could play the six degrees of Kevin Bacon game with most any evangelical leader. <laughs> Beyond the surreal experience of watching evangelicals do weird things, weird public things, what did all caps surprise me was the ads weren't bad. And, and they're not. They're well filmed. Um, I mean, they look professional. They don't, at least on their face, seem to promote a political agenda. The NPR article linked above, she linked above, uh, suggests one of the strategies was to appeal to people who felt excluded by the church with Jesus. She asks, really? Why does something within me not trust Hobby Lobby to focus exclusively on appealing <laughs> to marginalized people with Jesus? Is there another shoe that's going to drop? Do we think that decades of marginalization will be erased or forgotten with a 30-second ad spot? Yes. Why don't we just stop marginalizing people instead of making ad campaigns? Beyond all of this, uh, of course, is the age-old or at least dating to Marshall um, McLuhan argument about whether the medium of Super Bowl TV commercials can actually communicate that Jesus is for marginalized people while feeding literally millions of dollars into mainstream advertising and spectacle. Which is the thing that seems to surprise people on Twitter? Jesus on TV? Is that what we should be about? It reminds me of the 2015-16 uh, cycle when journalists fell over themselves asking how evangelicals could possibly break for Trump, who obviously does not reflect Jesus, betraying that sometimes secular people understand Jesus in their guts better than evangelicals do. Am I the only one who thinks this is weird? What do you all think? So <laughs> besides being one of the most well-written emails I think we have ever received, I think all of the salient points that I would want to make are covered in her analysis. Totally. So on the pro side, um, I'm sure that there, people are talking about this and wondering about this. And, and I'm for anything that inspires curiosity or presents a side of Jesus culturally that isn't often noted. Um, great. 
love it. And you know, my my wife, for instance, saw one of them and just was like thrilled. Hmm. Jesus was getting airtime that it was good, that it was helpful. Uh, I look at them and I'm a bit more skeptical, kind of like our, our questioner, <laughs> and certainly like my friend Timothy. Um, uh, and so I would have similar concerns. And and again, I mean, I don't know. Um, the idea that Jesus needs a PR campaign is, you know, <laughs> unfortunately very true, but the answer to Jesus needing a PR campaign is PR. And um, I don't know. I find, I find myself sort of very skeptical along your lines. I mean, Tim, what do you, how do you, I mean, you haven't seen these, so you I haven't, haven't seen it. Right. I should have. But uh, I, I think most all the normal points she made have seen I know. them. May, I, yeah. Well, I don't have TV anymore with commercials. We haven't for years. So I miss ads unless I'm watching Baseball. You're missing Jesus. I know, bro. but I would say all the things that uh, she said in her email are reservations that I would have. And then, like with what you just said about public relations and Jesus, that seems antithetical to most of the ways that he presented things also in his time, where he's just like, hey, nah, 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 let's not talk about this this way. I want you to go live it yeah. this way. Yeah. So this seems kind of opposite of that also, where it's like, does Jesus need a PR campaign or does he need Christians to be more Christ-like? Well, the church is supposed to be the PR campaign. And when right. it fails... To the very words of public relation. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, I so so my reservations... And, and again, I mean, there are people who genuinely like these, and I'm sure there are people who are having conversations about these. Hallelujah. I'm not going to argue with, um, you know, putting Jesus in very artful ways in front of culture. I, I'm a fan of that. That's one of the things we try to do ourselves. Um, so I don't want to... Huh? But to what end? Well, yeah, I mean, maybe uh, that would be a, a, a question. And, and the use of the medium, of course. How do you, you know, th that's very congruent with the megachurch spectacle approach of presenting Jesus to people, right? Which is to... Right. Um, present excellent, not always, but present semi-excellent um, cultural relevance and attaching that to Jesus. Uh, Jesus himself obviously didn't present himself <laughs> that way at all. It's like the, what was in dogma, the uh, Jesus was a cool, or was that what it was? Jesus was a I cool guy or whatever. The Jesus, not, the, the Catholic that, Church tries to rebrand itself. George Carlin's the uh, you know, whatever head of the church in that area, and they're doing the oh, it's called the Buddy Jesus, and they redid Jesus doing a thumbs up. And he's like super friendly, and they're trying to make him relevant to there it is. the culture at the time. And so it was like Buddy Jesus, like he's yeah. your friend, and yeah, yeah. I mean, and and yeah, he gets us, which he gets us, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And that's what like... Ma that's how Mackie has been pronouncing it for years. So maybe he was. <laughs> Oh, maybe he was behind the ad else. campaign. Yeah. That's Tim Mackey, by the way, of the Bible Project. The Bible Project we, presents. We love. He is one of us. Jesus. Yes. So, so I do think there's a great theological point being made that in this humanity, Jesus, of course, relates. The problem with that is it's the it's the the beautiful focus on us. That Jesus's job is to relate to us. That Jesus comes and and and, and in a sense, his incarnation does make that point that <laughs> yeah. Jesus comes suffering, you know, all of the trials and tribulations and frailties of being a human being. But the kind of he gets us, you know, slant on it. On the one hand, that'll preach, right? Because he does. He sympathizes. He's the high priest who sympathizes. But on the other hand, it keeps us at kind of the center of the picture where, um, hey, guys, I mean, Jesus isn't as awful as church people make him because he gets us. <laughs> And okay, I, I mean, cool. But um, if I were out promoting a message, I would promote a different message than he gets us. It's just an odd place to, you know, I don't know, Super Bowl. But it's perfect, man. We were talking um, in our little church community about how often the Super Bowl was one of the best Christian outreach events when I was a, a youth pastor. So we would have a Super Bowl party, and then uh, one of these big organizations would send us a pre-taped videotape of 
um, either current or ex football players who were Christians <laughs> sharing their testimony at halftime. Right. And um, and so you know the Super Bowl became this outreach event. And again, it's the it's the classic. Hey, let's use something that's culturally relevant. Right. And here are people who and and does God yeah and can God use those sorts of things? Of course. But it's <clears throat> excuse me. It's it reflects a mindset that I think all of us are increasingly skeptical of, which is um, showing the abs the the relevance of Jesus apart from any at, like embodied community. Yeah. Right. I just I mean, think it's like one of the most expensive events of the year. The commercial costs an obscene amount of money, which I feel like is already a bad message. The Super Bowl has weird implications around it too, with just like it being one of the highest human yeah. trafficking yeah. events of the in the world, and there's just so many things that. And then it, you just picture what a Super Bowl party looks like: a bunch of oh, people. Bro. It's loud. Bro. Everyone's bro. drinking, eating great snacks. No, no, it's like no. A hold fun... on a second. Hold on a second. You listen. You clearly are speaking out of your lane, bro. Because what what we did is we had Super Bowl parties. And it's S O U P, Super already, so you're Bowl. You're on the wrong first parties. So you would have soup at the party, and then you would have. <laughs> isn't drinking at this these things? Blasphemous. What are you talking about? Whatever. All dogma, I know is if somebody whatever. turns off. <laughs> so let me get this straight. So you're going to quote dogma with a straight yes. face, and then yes. tell me Super Bowl outreaches are blasphemous. Yes. Well, that if you turn off. Uh, Rihanna at halftime to show me ex football players sharing their testimony. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna be pissed. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'm not a huge Rihanna fan. Is that allowed to say in our in our world? I, I'll I'll say something even more controversial. What you already I, did? I think Rihanna's better than Beyonce. I don't think I don't think our listeners would appreciate that level of honesty from you. <laughs> um. <laughs> Let, let me let me let me just say it one more. I didn't even know the Grammys were still a thing. <laughs> I don't know that anybody does. We so, were talking about that this morning. Until actually, there was and... some until there was some um, devil scandal. Oh my goodness! Thing blowing up on my uh, Twitter timeline. I, I had yeah, no idea well... that gr- the Grammy still existed. It's like the MTV Music Awards. Yep. Like evidently that's still happening, even though there aren't music videos. Yep. Yep. Oh, I thought of something good from the week. Yes, yes, we're I, eighteen we had minutes a day in. Off. We, uh, someone took our kids and we went skiing. It was for her birthday. We went skiing and then we went and had one of our favorite restaurants, a sushi place in Truckee, that Ooh. is unreal. And it was one of the best meals I've ever had. Wow! And we came home and binged a show called Poker Face. Yeah, it was great. It was a good day. We don't ha- we hardly ever get time together like that, so it was really fun. That's fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Do you do you feel bad at all? It took that long to remember. I'm never good when I'm put on the spot. That's not true. My You're, brain immediately goes. No, oh, you don't play. You can't play that card because all you do is quip one liners under all the things <laughs> when I'm rambling. So don't. We don't rehearse this. What are you talking about? You're always on the spot. Fair enough. Don't, so don't even. All right. Um, so we got, yeah. So thank you for that, for that email. Well, you're not yeah, the I'm only to go ones look that up those ads after, after. Yes. Done. Yes. Well, go find that email. She links to a, um, NPR article too. That's, that's great. But, um, no, we're, I find it a little weird and, and I'm sure there are loads of people who love it. I just, to me, it reflects a mindset and an approach to evangelism yes. that I just don't, I don't buy anymore. I used to, because that was the only approach I knew. Uh, I don't right. buy that anymore. Um, so we've done thank yous. We've done. Oh, you had a couple of uh, you had a couple of things, Timothy, to kind of get us into our topic this morning yeah. or today. I some, or I got some Tim's afternoon. troubled times, which I don't know what will show on the video when that happens. Tim's troubled times. <laughs> um, first, I was reading. Well, man, there's so many things, but I'm going to try to truncate yeah. them down. Okay. The school board thing. So we were that's ha- that's happening in our area. And since my wife is a high school teacher, it's a constant conversation because they're trying to tell the teachers what they can and cannot teach. And um, so there was a big school board meeting that a lot of parents came out to, and that was interesting. But we were having a conversation about how the the conservative sect that's causing all of this kerfuffle in America is a Ooh, good is word. A, 
small, it's a minority, but they are affecting everything. And so it's mm. a really interesting kind of conversation to look at how can such a small vocal minority be causing so much havoc everywhere. Yeah. And so, and then the same week, um, there's an article in Rolling Stone on the death penalty and how we'd only killed uh, three people from like 1960 to 2020, mm. like executed, and that Trump pushed through 13. Um, and it, the way the article talks about it is that it's in a large part an effort to be to show that as a Republican, he's tough on crime. But it definitely escalates a conversation that Shane Claiborne's been going yeah, every day. Yeah, his book just, just came out, didn't it? Yeah, and he's been rallying hard on this topic of trying to... Because it's not just a Republican thing. You know, uh, Biden went to a um, a summit with, with a bunch of nations, and a lot of nations vowed off, like, we will no longer execute. We're going to get rid of the death penalty. And America's like, no, nah, we're going to keep it. Mm. And there's been a couple that just died this week from that mm, so it mm. is a hard conversation as a christian it's a hard conversation as an american to justify why we're still killing people that we're using killing to ju- to punish killing and that kind of stuff and then um, our mutual friend sent me this page from this is from jared bias the guy that's on um the tandem to the bible uh to the bible for normal people with pete ends but i thought this was good because it kind of talks about as we're doing revelation and Christian nationalism and what it means to be a Christian in America. So this is just a little excerpt from that. It says, for example, I do believe, do I believe in Jesus' re- resurrection? We most often ask that expecting that we, we most often ask that expecting that we answer based on an idea we have in our head as though that's what's important. The better question is this, do we trust in Jesus' resurrection? To be honest, that's a question that can only be answered by watching someone's behavior. Otherwise, instead of the resurrection being something that transforms lives and changes how we treat one another, it becomes a fact that we simply check off the list in our head. To believe, in quotes, in the resurrection is not a matter of saying, yes, I believe that, but to live a resurrection life that pursues resurrection in our everyday life. Every time I see someone and feel like I'm better than they are, I show that I do not trust in Jesus' resurrection. Every time I'm uncomfortable sitting next to a transgender person on a plane, I show that I do not trust in Jesus' resurrection. Every time I insist on my way without considering the needs of my spouse, I show that I do not trust in Jesus' resurrection. What does it matter to the world and to people around me if I check off belief in Jesus' resurrection as a fact, but it doesn't inform how I live my life? When someone asks me, what do you believe? I'm more likely to answer what I wish I believed than what I actually believe. If you're just going by what's in your head, what's the difference between what you actually believe and what you wish you believed? Almost none. So that was interesting just with a lot of what we're talking about and how this idea of what does it mean to live in the belief and the trust? Because they, you know, that's something we've talked about too is a lot of mm-hmm. ways that believe is translated in the Bible is actually more akin to trust, Mm -hmm. which I thought was really Mm -hmm. helpful for me to think about what does it mean to trust in what Jesus has said, to trust in the resurrection of what is expecting of my life and my response in my community and in Auburn where I live and in California and in America, what does it look like to live in a trust of this resurrection and how that informs the way I live amongst other people. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. It kind of provoked a little thought in my head for a few hours that day and then and just thinking about what we're talking about I was like well how do we you know how do we model that as as a political entity yeah yeah I think that's good I I always and he's not saying this but I, I I I'm always weary wary excuse me of people who turn resurrection into a metaphor for being loving right like uh, and he's not saying this but there were enough hints of it that i was like huh i wonder like if the point is yeah um enough enough with the mental checklists and more into living into the reality a- amen and that's kind of amen. what i took from it is like it's not yeah. just a, a pronoun like a you know yeah yeah, it's like it's like marriage, right? I mean, marriage was an event that happened. 
that produced a new reality, something that right. truly happened in the real world that produced a reality that I get to either live into or not. <laughs> totally. And that's always been a great example for that, that you've used yeah. before of like, just because, or like when having the, having Nate for the, you know, the first child coming in and you not immediately being a father in the embodied full understanding sense, but right. you are right. entitled. Right. But the, yeah, the idea of living into an event. And so, yeah, 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 yeah. And if that's what we're talking about, I mean, hallelujah, that's yeah. couldn't, couldn't agree, couldn't agree more. Um, as long as it's rooted in something that really happened, then I'm very cool. I just, every Easter I get these, you know, there's somebody that tweets something about, you know, that it's such a great picture of, uh, or such a great metaphor symbol of new life. The resurrection like, being a metaphor. Yeah. And it's like, well, at that point, I mean, there aren't many things like, like the apostles sort of <laughs> said, hey, this is like so central that if you don't believe this, then you're <laughs> believing something else. But that's right. sort of one of them. And again, I mean, God, God bless Jared. I'm not saying anything bad about what your quote was. And that's where my brain went right. was to say, yes, we're living in the echoes of an event. And if that event doesn't have real world, um, uh, you know, exemplification, then, you know, we might as well just believe something else. Yeah. Right. And I think that's where at the root of why I think it stuck out is at the root of deconstruction as that has become so demonized in conversation. So much of it is that like, is this a quip? Is this like a, a thing that I just check off as part of my personality? Like, yes, I am a Christian. Yes. I believe in resurrection. And it's just like, yeah. A, yeah. Pieces of your name tag or are these things that we embody and live into and understand and know and believe in, what was it that Jesus advocated for? And are we doing that? Or are we just claiming his name and being totally buttheads? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it means to take his name in vain, right? To totally. attach his name <laughs> yep. to some empty, empty, empty thing. Like the Super to Bowl. Yes. <laughs> Unless JK. You're, oh my goodness. Now you're, now you're really getting into the <laughs> blasphemous. Um, so, so I, I want to do a little bit with, um, Revelation today. And again, we're doing, we're spending, or we're going to spend lots of time on backdrop. And and some of this we've covered as part of the Bible series. So for those of you who listen very regularly, this is review. Um, for those of you who are newer to the podcast, then hopefully this is, um, this is really helpful stuff. Because for me, this is where, how you interpret Revelation, the entire battle, if you will, is fought here. Yeah. And uh, the, the term that people like Tim and other English professors will use is the term genre. That's right. And that just means a style of literary composition, at least as it pertains to writing. You have musical genres and film genres, but when it comes to composition, there are different styles of writing and and um, the example that is so profound. So one of the biggest things I miss about the early two thousands is that we had <laughs> bookstores. <laughs> we had bookstores, Tim Barnes and Nobles and Borders. They were everywhere. Yeah. And um, and so I just used to hang out at bookstores all the time. If I could own a bookstore, I would own a bookstore. That would just be like my dream ever. Yeah. Um, my dream, biggest dream ever. Thank you, English. And uh, one of the things that Barnes and Nobles did, Barnes and Noble did, is that they um, they would uh, arrange <coughs> their um, books by genre. So yeah. there would be a section for biology, there would be a section for philosophy, a section for religion, a section for science, a section for science fiction, a section for poetry. And, uh, and there were these helpful little signs that uh, let you know, you know, exactly where those books were. And one of the things that we subconsciously do is that we go into each of those sections with different expectations about what we're going to find there, right? If I go into the or, science um... section, I'm expecting to find something much different than if I go into the science fiction section. Right. right. There are all sorts of assumptions and I don't even do this consciously, um, but I, I carry in assumptions when I'm going to the science fiction section 
as opposed to the expectations I would have of a science book. Um, if I go to poetry or if I go to his history, I have a different set of expectations than I would historical fiction. Totally. You know, based on a true story is different than, oh, here's the true story that happened as right. best we can, you know, recollect. And so the issue with the Bible is that the Bible is a Barnes and Noble bookstore of genre all packed into one book, but without any modern signifiers that we're dealing with massively different forms of literature. Yeah. So the Bible doesn't say, hey, now this is apocalyptic literature, or now this is parabolic literature, or hey, this is historical narrative, or hey, this is like Egyptian love poetry literature, or hey, this is like mythic creation account literature. Like it just, you just open it at page one and you read the whole thing as if it were one genre of literature. Yeah. And that's where our dispensationalist friends will say, yes, we read the Bible literally. Uh, we open it, and here's a six-day creation, and here's a, an exodus, and here's a, and it's and it's just a reporting of historical facts. And I think there are loads of historical facts in the Bible, but I also think there's loads of symbolism in the Bible. And how do you know which is which? And the answer is genre. How do you what do you call it to say like to say that the Bible should just be open and read literally, and Every church I've ever been a part of has had classes on, we're reading the Bible in a year, or we're reading the Bible in right. X amount of time, just because that's important to do, just to read it cover to cover over and over again. Yep. Um, how would you how would you frame that? Like you're you're putting expectations on the Bible that aren't that aren't that the Bible doesn't yeah, is put that on how you itself. Would say that? Yeah. So I would say it's a flat reading, meaning you're coming at every text, and we covered this in the Bible series ad nauseum, but you're coming at every text expecting the text to fit modern conceptions of history or narrative structure or, you know, I, and, and we're, as we talked about before, hermeneutical narcissists, where we think the Bible is written <laughs> to us, for us, and about us, and totally. it's actually well, none, of those, yeah. none of those things yet. Yeah, absolutely. So when we read the Bible flatly, we just open the book and start reading. Yeah. And and there's power in that. I mean, I, I, I've i read the Bible through several times, and even though I haven't understood it all, there's benefit in seeing the whole story and, and understanding there are different parts to it and how the different parts sort of feel. Like when you're in the middle of Isaiah or Jeremiah and you're like completely lost about what we're talking about. <laughs> it feels differently than when you're in Job and you're like, really, there's this bet going on as opposed to you're in the life of Jesus where it seems straightforward until you get to the book of John and then it's all super stylized. <laughs> and then you get to first, second, and third John, which feels so different than Romans. And you're just like, how, this is such a mishmash. And, um, and so, and, so, and so, yeah, <laughs> ab- yes. Yes, and, and we talk a lot in the Bible series about why that is. But the big point is simply that when you approach the Bible, you're approaching a Barnes & Noble bookstore. The problem is there aren't the signs that tell you right. that there it is different kinds of literature demanding to be read differently. Now, intuitively, we know that Song of Songs is different than 1 Samuel, right? We, we understand that, but, but it gets super confusing when you get to apocalyptic literature, which we're going to talk about a lot today, where the temptation is to read that literally, but every convention of apocalyptic literature demands that you read it symbolically. Yeah. And we'll get to that in a second. So big point number one today is review for lots of you. I totally know that, but I can never stress it enough. Yeah. That when you get to Revelation, the big the big question is what genre of book is Revelation? And that will tell you then how you understand this, the specific details. Now, one other thing that the Bible does, the Bible will often give you genre clues, just like Barnes & Noble does. The problem is they're not in English and they're ancient. And so we don't, <laughs> we don't at all recognize them as genre clues. So like a genre clue would be verbally, if I say something like, hey, once upon a time, if I read or say once upon a time, Tim, what, what form of literature is coming? A fairy tale or... Yeah, yeah. And they lived happily ever after. 
we would know exactly what that is. Now, let's say 2,000 or 4,000 years from now, right. you know, they, they pick up a book and says, once upon a time, there were three pigs. They would be mistaken to try to identify the three pigs, right. correct? Like, Whoa, man, the 20th century was nuts. Yes, and there was a wolf? <laughs> Come on. Um, right? They would be totally mistaken to do that. So when yeah. Jesus says, hey, a man has two sons, it, similarly, it would be wrong to go to try to identify who the two sons were. I want to interview them about this story right. to see if it's accurate, right? You would just know that intuitively. Um, or to say like, hey, two guys walk into a bar. We would know, <laughs> Tim, what is that? A joke. A joke. We would know that that is a stylized thing to bring about humor. If I read, hey, Joe Biden campaigns in Pennsylvania for a steel mill, I would know that that's reportedly historical fact. If I began to say, hey, Tim, roses are red and violets are blue, would I be speaking about, you know, Science. plant life? Yes. <laughs> Agriculture. <laughs> yes. Or I would be making some sort of, you know, annoying poetic point. Or if I said, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we would already know what, you know, a piece of science fiction. So the point is, those are all scattered in the Bible. Those kinds of things are scattered throughout the Bible. And they would have been recognized by the ancient readers. They're not to us for the same reason that, like, political cartoons are not going to be... like. So, so let me explain political cartoons for a second. Because this... This is how symbolism functions in Revelation. This is a super important point I want to take a moment on. So there used to be these things called newspapers. And, and they were, and I'm not kidding when I say this. Some of our audience will not have seen them. Um, but, you know, you used to, like hotels, there would be a USA Today that would be at your doorstep. And it, they were these massively large pieces of paper. Some of them <laughs> had color and they would have different stories and different sections. And it was great. One of the things that um, newspapers would have is they would have political cartoons. So they would be sketched out drawings that make a profound point, but it, they, it, you wouldn't be using words to do that. You would sketch out images and symbols. And so... Yeah. You know, I remember after 9-11, it was a very famous um, picture of an eagle that was sharpening its talons. Mm. And that was the whole cartoon, just this big stylized eagle sharpening its talons with a nail file. And, um, you know, 2,000 years from now, you would look at that and say, well, that's kind of an odd photograph, <laughs> right, or something. Is this but how you they wouldn't... fought then? Yeah, yeah, they're using eagles. Um, and you would have to do a little bit of cultural homework to know that the eagle stands for the United States yeah. and that something horrible had just happened. And the talons represented the miracle, the miracle, the military might of America that was getting ready to be deployed um, in an act of retaliation and justice against the perpetrators of this heinous thing, right? right. You would yep. you would have to do some the cultural work. homework, or yeah. or you know there used to be um, a a picture of this old white guy with a white beard right. and a and a top hat, and on one shoulder there would be a donkey whispering into his ear, and on the other shoulder there was an elephant whispering into his ear. Obviously, we would know that bearded figure as Uncle Sam, again, symbolic of the United States as a nation. The donkey representing one political party, the elephant representing a different political party. But if 2,000 years from now, somebody picked up a picture of that and said, man, that was animals could talk. Um, we should be on the lookout for talking donkeys and elephants. We would all go, nope, you've missed it entirely, right? Yeah. Totally. Because the point of those images, those are symbolic images that, that speak into a cultural conversation that we're all fluent in. Right. Well, Revelation does the same thing with two streams of thought. The Old Testament, um, Old Testament pictures of Yahweh are now going to be applied to Jesus. And Roman imperial propaganda is going to be applied to Jesus. And those two cultural beds of imagery and symbolism are going to be deployed around Jesus in symbolic ways, in the same way an elephant and an eagle and a donkey are all deployed in symbolic ways 
you know, in the last 20 years. Yeah. And it's completely wrong when you go into Revelation to read the numbers, the colors, uh, and the details, uh, unless otherwise specified, it is totally wrong to read them as anything other than eagles, donkeys, and um, and elephants. Right. Does that make sense? Totally. So the nice thing is that Revelation actually tells us that it is the com- combination of three literary genres. Um, and we're going to look at one today and um, and two in a couple of episodes. Um, and so so in the same way you would read, um, hey, once upon a time, and that was the opening sentence of a book, you would know what was coming. Well, I mean, literally the first sentence of Revelation is the revelation, singular. All right, so let's not call it Revelations. Right. If you're out there and you call it the book of Revelations, Jesus Stop. is probably <laughs> laughing at you. Um, no, I, I mean... It, yeah. Anyway, it's called that in a lot of a um, lot of circles. It's just the singular revelation, and the next word is the word from Jesus Christ. But that word could be translated about Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. to Jesus Christ, or from Jesus Christ. But the idea is the revelation from Jesus Christ. That's the first, you know, uh, clause of the book, and the first word of that clause of the book is the word apocalypsis which is the word unveiling or revelation. We should make and, a cereal of this and you can make marshmallows for all of the different like beasts and signs, but we can call it like apocalypse. Yeah. Mm. See, <laughs> when you say things like, hey, you know, uh, that was, I'm not ready off the top of my head. And then you say things like that. It just, I mean, Tim, that was really one of the worst you've ever <laughs> Or Matt Miller and I used to always joke about making a cereal for the movie Seven, and oh, you'd have marshmallows word. for the Seven Deadly Sins, but then the commercial would just be like, "What's in the box? What's in the box?" You so the movie to get that reference. So, ladies and gentlemen, one of the reasons <laughs> why we have Timothy Stafford on the program, besides he's just an artistic genius, and mm-hmm. um, and many other things, is that is that. You know, he really represents the reprobate part of our audience <laughs> and demographic. And so... And if there's a retro, if there's like a sub-genre within that too, that's even worse. <laughs> we love Halloween. That's we're right. quoting Dogma. And we're making cereal out of the movie Seven. Hopefully yep. it'd be low in sugar so that um, it wouldn't cause gluttony, one of the sins. Anyway, so thank you for that. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're welcome. So apocalypsis is not a cereal. It is a Greek word that means the disclosing of something that was previously hidden, but now is being made known. And um, apocalypsis is also, that's what the Greek word means, but it also refers to a kind of literature that was very, very common in um, the kind of two centuries before and after Uh, the life of Jesus. And it was called apocalyptic literature based upon that word, uh, uh, apocalypsis. And and the idea is that apocalyptic literature revealed something that was hidden. It gave you, it unveiled something. You you thought, and and there are instances of this all over in the Old Testament. There's, There's one instance where the armies of God are threatened and the prophet says, God, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? And God sort of gives this, this picture of all of the angels uh, and the armies of heaven combined with the like the physical armies and and you're like oh okay that's that's an apocalypse that's that's an unveiling or a revelation so the idea is that this is an unveiling of Jesus Christ from Jesus Christ about Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ of Jesus Christ It is not an unveiling of the timing of the end days. It's not an unveiling of the Antichrist. It is not the unveiling of a calendar or a code that you have to decode. It is centrally and exclusively the unveiling of Jesus of Nazareth. And, and, And when we look at the other two genres, that becomes even more clear. 
All right, so Jesus is at the center of whatever this unveiling turns out to be. So literally the first word is apocalypsis, all right? Then... It's a good clue. That's where it starts. Yeah, and, and again, an ancient reader would read that right. in the same way we'd read Once Upon a Time and go, yeah, oh, right. yeah, 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 I, I know, I know. Yeah. So ap- apocalypsis was not only a word that was used to describe an unveiling, but it was also a kind of literature that had the unveiling as kind of the point. Right. There were all sorts of apocalypses. I mean, you can you can find them online. Um, there are loads of these, and 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 because we have um, lots of examples of apocalyptic literature, not only in the Bible but outside the Bible, we can characterize the normal aspects and conventions of apocalyptic literature um, in the same way that there are normal aspects and conventions around science fiction or around. Um, you know, historical narration, there were conventions around apocalyptic literature that we have to utterly and absolutely take into account when we get to the individual verses of Revelation. All right. So there are eight of these that I just want to um, quickly highlight. And we're going to come back to these like crazy. Um, because when we get to beasts, or when we get to um, dragons, or a woman giving birth in heaven with twelve stars, or lampstands, um, we're or you know um, four horsemen. We're going to be um, in, in because we're schooled and left behind sort of motif of understanding these texts. We're going to be tempted to say, okay, so what what contemporary fulfillment is there right. for these images? And the answer is there's none. Unless you're talking about a symbolic way where 2,000 years from now, maybe they don't have eagles and donkeys and elephants, but they still have politics. Mm -hmm. And the picture of a nation being whispered in different ears by two political, different political entities could still speak. Um, That's how Revelation speaks to us. It it, It speaks through its symbols to us without having to find a necessary reference to each and every one. Yeah. So um, characteristics of apocalyptic literature, there are eight. Number one, it's usually written under the guise of a pseudonym. Um, and so you'll have you know, books written by Moses or Enoch, or uh, it's usually uh, a convention is, is that it's usually written in the name of some great um, earlier person. Uh, with John, though, John actually names himself as the author, and he does that several times. Um, and we don't know which John it is. It could be the John of the Gospels, or it could be the first John and first, second, and third John, which could be the same as the John of the Gospels or not. I mean, there's all sorts of debate. We just don't know. He identifies himself as John the Elder. Um, uh, so, so that's in, that's one instance where. And maybe, maybe this was a pseudonym, but but there are literary aspects that seem to say no. He was actually like that was that was meant to encourage his audience and comfort his audience. Yeah. Why would you? Why would they use pseudonyms? You know, like why would you reference a biblical hero for before if it wasn't from them? Um, the from what I understand, uh, it gives them. Um, Credence. So like if I were to say the book of Enoch, so Enoch is the shadowy, mysterious biblical figure, right? Who t- teleports into heaven is like one of the oldest people that's ever lived. And only two people, I think he and Elijah are the two that get swept up into heaven. And if I say it's, it's the book of Enoch, that gives me all sorts of room to explore the mysteries, you know, the untold gaps in the Enoch story. Same with Abraham, right? There's like there, there, um, or Solomon. And it, it seems like the convention was that you would use them to give them weight and authority, but that also, but they also were characters that allowed for literary invention, mm. um, because they had very mythic stories, you know, kind of attached to them. But I don't, I wouldn't know anything more than that as to why that was the normal convention. Well, it makes it interesting because if John is the actual author and not a pseudonym, it seems like it actually does lend credence to it because it's not grandstanding yes. or like well, well, and and we'll actually get to the fact. So so John takes this apocalyptic literature 
and he forms it into an, an epistle. That's one of the other genres of this. Yeah, that's interesting. And so that's why we, we don't take John as a pseudonym. We take it because he, he will say literally he'll begin and end the the book of Revelation in very like, Similar ways as what Paul would do in Philippians right. or Ephesians or whatever. So, um, so, so this is an instance where um, the the letter that we have, because it's a combination of three genres, um, this is an instance where, yeah, the the epistle part of this kind of shines through rather than the pseudonym. Although, if we th- discovered it was a pseudonym written by the community of John. You know, I still, I trust the spirit of God to have given us whatever it is that God wanted us to have. Right. The, so the second thing is, is um, it usually, apocalypses usually take a narrative form. And, um, and, and Revelation certainly does that. And that's part of the reason why people want to read it linearly, because right. it comes to us as a narrative. The problem is... We're going to see this in the heart of the book. There are these repeated cycles of judgment that all end the same way, hmm. and um, so you get you get these three cycles of seven. And I used to think those were cumulative, right? There was one th- set of seven, and then another set of seven, and then another set of seven. But uh, they all end the same way. So it's it's three seven saying and identifying the same thing in three different ways. Mm. So even though it comes to us in a narrative form, and that that is what makes us tempted to kind of see this um, literally, is because it says you know, and then, uh, right. and then after that, right? Um, that makes a lot it, of sense. Yeah, totally, it does. But this was normal for apocalypses. Thirdly, and this is a point we've already um, uh, made, but uh, apocalyptic literature is ex- uh, so full of symbolism that uh, to read it any other way, you know, is to is to uh, to make a pretty massive mistake. Um, so, so the first sentence in the book of Revelation is the revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave Jesus to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. Now, this phrase, made it known, is a Greek word that means to signify or symbolize. And a guy named Gregory Beale um, spends loads of time in his massive and ridiculous and awesome commentary on Revelation talking about how this word that we translate make it known means make it known through symbols and it's mm-hmm. a it's a word that is used in the greek translation of daniel um and he goes into loads and loads of detail but the point is you would have understood john saying uh, john recording this is the apocalypsis around and about and for jesus of nazareth which God gave Jesus to give John through intermediaries, messengers or angels. And he did it symbolically. He made it known symbolically to him. Um, and so that's literally the first sentence. And the first that's sentence huge. already tells you, yeah. yeah, it tells you how the rest of the book is to be understood. And if you're wondering, if something's symbolic, it doesn't mean that it's not real. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, we do have a, a Republican Party symbolized right. by the elephant. And we have a nation symbolized by Uncle Sam and we have a, a Democrat Party symbolized by. So just because it's symbolic doesn't mean it's real. It means that you cannot take the details of the symbols and turn them into the details of the truth behind the symbols. Right. Right. Um, fourthly, and boy, this one is so true. Um uh, apocalyptic uh, literature employs esoteric language that is interpreted through a heavenly intermediary. And you already hear this in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Jesus to show his servant through his angels, must soon take place. So, so this is like filtered three times. God to Jesus, Jesus to the angels, the angels to John. That is just a very normal apocalyptic convention. That, it, that, that we're getting a he- heavenly point of view 
that cannot be discerned without heavenly help and interpretation. Hmm. You know? So the apocalyptic, the unveiling isn't done by human insight. The unveiling is done through an, a heavenly intermediary. Yeah, well, that's a lot right there. A lot right there, baby. Apocalypses are characterized by dualism, that there is always a war between good and evil, mm. um, and that there are two forces competing for the allegiance of whoever the audience is. Number six, uh, apocalypses treat the final events as imminent. So P John is going to say seven, I think it's seven times. Uh, I'll have to look and double check that, but I think it's seven. What must soon take place? Um, he even leads with this. What must soon take place? And, and so we're all very tempted to read that as a calendar reference. But he's uh. not talking about literal time there. He's talking about a kind of time, imminent time. Like, like Revelation isn't a book about ordinary time, Kronos. It's a book about Kairos, which is unique time. Like you're going to read this and realize this is a unique time, no matter whenever it is that you read this. Because these things will soon take place. And we'll have a whole section on a future podcast about what must soon take place. But those aren't calendar references. Th those are imminent references. Like, yeah. like this is happening now, guys. You know what I mean? Yep. And then now there isn't, oh, you mean like it's February you know, 14th? No. It means it's happening in the great now since Jesus had risen from the dead. Okay. And, and, and we'll spend more time on this. Yeah. But again, I'm just showing how Revelation fits into the normal conventions of once upon a time. Yeah. Right? Um, number seven, uh, apocalyptic literature is written usually by minority communities for minority communities, and it expresses a pessimistic view of the present time. And so we get that in Revelation. That Revelation sees... The, the historical time in which it's written as a time of great falling away, great idolatry, great immorality. And, um, and we, that's totally characteristic of the other apocalypses of its day. So it's that written not only by is there, minority, for minority, about, and is pessimistic about the present the current, age. The current, so, yeah. so the dualism that we mentioned earlier happens around time. There is this present age and the age to come. Right. Okay, so that's dualistic. It happens around um, space. There is the the there is heavenly space and then earthly space. Uh, it happens around beings. There are heavenly beings that are good and heavenly beings that are bad. And it happens around people. There are people who are good and people who are bad. And it's very absolutist in its language. And that's what makes it dualistic, right? It's like you're either. Right. The sons of light or the sons of darkness. And that those two forces are locked in conflict. Right. So the dualism applies to time and space and to beings. Yeah. All right. All throughout the book. And then lastly, um, apocalypse is one of the ways they provide hope and comfort is because they present a determined, a predetermined future that God wins. So, um, and, the, and that the marginalized people will be vindicated. And so we're going to meet the martyrs. Um, and the martyrs are crying out to God for vindication. And, and it's not until chapter 20 that the martyrs are vindicated mm -hmm. and that the dead in Christ are vindicated. But this is a very normal convention. So it employs esoteric language through a heavenly intermediary. It's very, it's very dualistic, right? It's good and bad all over the place. Uh, all the important things are happening now, but it's not a time now. It's an urgency now. Right. Um, uh, the current situation is pessimistic and not going to get better unless there's some sort of divine rescue. Um, we can't work ourselves out of this, but um, God does win in the end. There is a determined future. And so the biggest point for our purposes is, is that Revelation comes to us with a lot of the, these eight characteristics. Right. And in no instance are apocalypses meant to be taken literally or turned into calendar dates or, right, or even linearly. Uh, it's not just 
that we don't take all of it literally, but but very often people will say, yeah, yeah, it's a symbolic, but then they'll take it linear, linearly and say, oh yeah, there, then it's just a sequence of events, whenever right. it happens, whether it's already happened in the past or will happen in the future. And that's not even what this is doing. Right. And that's kind of the stuff with like 1988 and like we just yes. look at this and try to map out so we can understand the when and the where. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. If you want examples, I mean, there there are apocalyptic scenes in Ezekiel and in Daniel, and it's no wonder that you know part of the dispensationalist argument is an appeal to Daniel, right? Um, um, and in Ezekiel and Ezekiel's you know vision of a new temple, um, because those are those are all interrelated kinds of literature. Even Jesus speaks apocalyptically. Uh, like in Mark 13 or late in Matthew when he's talking about, he sounds like he's talking about the destruction of the temple. And then it seems like he's talking about the Son of Man returning and all sorts of debate about was that a, a, a past thing or a future thing. So there are examples of apocalyptic literature in other places in the Bible. Um, but if you go into Revelation thinking, as I did, we all did, that it's presenting a calendar of right. end times events that are happening literally in our time, then you're going to generate a certain reading of Revelation that is completely at odds with the assumption that this was a very standard form of literature that would have been understood by the original audience that involves massive use of symbols. So all the numbers are symbolic, the colors are symbolic, the repeat the the patterns are mm. symbolic, um, and it was it was so great. We were going over a very abbreviated um, version of this conversation in our uh, church community in Tennessee, and um, this wonderful. She's probably 18, 19, 20 years old, and she comes up to me after one of these teachings, and we do we do a Q and A, and I mean, we give loads of room for people to, you know, disagree, and she just comes up, and she's like, you know, I just want you to know, I don't buy it. I just don't buy it. I think the numbers are more literal than what you say. And my first thought was, you're in good company. There are really smart people who hold right. that view. But my second thought was, the fact that you, as a young woman, feel comfortable approaching the old white dude on the platform <laughs> to disagree. Yeah. What a what a beautiful thing. So yeah. as we go through Revelation, the goal isn't that you buy what I'm selling. Um, I'm convinced of it, or I wouldn't be doing this. And I, I think it is much truer to the text. And I think there's been harm done by different approaches to the book. And so I do want to like... And I, I do want to erode the use of this book uh, in service to Christian nationalism, in service to hellfire and brimstone, evangelism, in service to keeping people fearful when the book was meant to bring comfort. See, that's the key thing right there. That is what I keep thinking about while you're talking, and I think it's so fascinating, is what is the, what is the one thing that people are the most afraid of across the board as humans, and it's death. And then if you couple death with burning for eternity, <laughs> you have like just a monumental mountain of fear. Well, burn, death this for is an eternity, so... because you, you, you didn't either believe right or live right or but something. that's huge too, right? Because this is, you just went through, you just spent 45 minutes or however long going through just how people in the first sentence have start from a place of misunderstanding how to like why this book exists, right? Like right, what right. is it used for? And it has been used predominantly. It's just so fascinating. Is Yahweh a God of fear? Right. Is that God's primary motivation to win people over? Right. And is the Bible, the sword of truth that's used to intimidate and, and cause that fear and most people, I don't think, would use that terminology, but that's exactly how it's been used for so long is to cultivate fear, and then how right. do you respond to that fear? And the best way to understand how to navigate fear would be to put a timeline together of how the world is going to end and how to be on the right side of the fence of that. 
totally and it's like that's and it's so opposite of that and it's so invitational and instructional but instead we're like i just think it's so interesting how Uh, it is it's been a platform piece of christianity and fear the the fear of the lord is a is a positive thing. Right. C.S. Lewis but, used to talk about that a lot in great yes, ways. But but the fear of the Lord is like my fear of electricity. It's <laughs> it is like I don't live in anxiety about electricity, but I have a great deal of respect for its power. Yeah, you're not gonna and stick I your appre- finger in the light socket. Yes, and- I I live wisely around electricity. So Yahweh comes and, and again, we can talk about all the, the Old Testament images of Yahweh as angry and Yahweh as wrathful and Yahweh as jealous and Yahweh as threatening his people. And there are conventions, I mean, to all of those things. Um, but the fear that Yahweh wanted to instill in his people is the fear that an electrician would want to instill around lightning or right. around electricity. An awe, a sense of wonder, um, I'm comforted by the presence of electricity. I miss it when it's gone, right? Um, lightning <laughs> right. can be beautiful, but it also like it's bigger than me. I can't control it. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think Yahweh, and I think Jesus too, because you know when John sees Jesus here, he falls face down as though dead. Right. And this is the dude. If it's the same John that you know called himself. The disciple that Jesus loved, right? All of a sudden, you know, and he's reclining at the table in the Last Supper. Right. Now he's like, "Oh snap! <laughs> oh crap! <laughs> yeah, right." And well, so, one more question: are, are you oh, are you at the end of your notes? Yes, for today. Well, for okay. now, for today, for today. You bet. Um, the other thing too that I, something that keeps getting brought up in conversations that I've been having with people is how. You know, and so we had someone email in too and ask, you know, why do you need a friggin' degree to approach the Bible, right? Yeah. So the Bible, as we go through these books, as we talked about the Bible and the Bible series, as you have just started to bring us into this and the idea of genre, the idea of understanding who the audience is and what's being done and understand the language and the intention of that time period, uh, I would assume that um, God was aware of our timeline and that those of us 2,000 years later are reading this through a veil of some sort. Mm -hmm. Um, So that has to be part of the intent of our relationship to this text. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the fact that Jesus speaks in sometimes apocalyptic ways or parabolic Mm -hmm. ways or Mm -hmm. whatever... The intent, I would assume, again, is not to monumentally confuse people because they want to send everyone to hell. That's right. Or God wants, I've only got so many seats, guys, so it's like, I'm going to make this, like, if you, yeah. you, you got to earn yeah. this. Like, you got to yeah. figure it out and earn it. Because yeah. that's kind of, if when you pull the thread on all of this, that's how that plays out. Right. But this idea that we, there is some work to be done on our behalf in wrestling with this, and there is mystery that we will be confused by yeah and that we will struggle with that has to be part of the puzzle well and so that really frames things for me in a way that i don't quite understand yet but there is something to that that takes for me takes some of the fear out of yes the way that i was raised of like get it right you know turn or burn get it right or you're in trouble instead it's like hey we're involved in a conversation that is much larger and in, and takes some imagination and takes some study and takes these things. And those aren't negative because the outcome is not that he wants to punish you because you misinterpreted or misunderstood, but but, but that it's bigger and, and more yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. or something. Let's, let's I don't talk know. about that. No, no, that's so good, Tim. So we've talked before about the scandal of historical particularity okay. that we <laughs> wish the Bible... Title. We Yeah, there you go. We wish the Bible came to us in English, with universal truths that can be appreciated and Just seen by everybody without argument at the same time, and we could all agree, and it would just be super clear. And if that were the goal, then I think there are better ways that the Bible could come to us, for yeah. sure. Um, the fact that 
God chose an historical people, Israel, in the real world, um, uh, and in a specific time, language, culture, and then Jesus comes in a specific time, language, culture, means that and requires then that we do some work. Yeah. Um, just as you were saying, but why? And I, I think the reason that we've talked about before, I, I still just, I see it in the way I parent my kids and grow as a husband and as a pastor, is that the goal isn't, you know, crystal clear truthfulness on everything. The, the, the goal is wisdom and allegiance and trust, like Jared was saying earlier. Yeah, that's um, huge. That's a and, huge difference. And, and it is a huge difference, and it requires participation. Yeah. This is the reason Jesus told parables. So when he tells the parable of the prodigal father, one of the sons comes home, the rebellious one, but we learn that there's another rebellious one who's angry and resentful, and that is that son stands in for the Pharisees. The reason Jesus doesn't end the parable by telling us what happens is because we're supposed to find ourselves in the older brother and decide for ourselves whether or not. Yeah, that's huge. Right. Well, I think I think that is a stand-in for how the whole Bible comes to us. Yeah. The whole Bible comes to us as an unfinished parable where we are now invited to step into the reality described by the text or to not. And now is that kind of what N.T. Wright's fifth act is? Yes. Speaking to Kay. Yes, that's exactly exactly right. N.T. Wright, if you're not familiar with this, envisions our participation in scripture as a group of improvisational actors and actresses who have immersed themselves in a recently discovered Shakespearean play (sighs) where we have the first four acts of the play and we have the end of the fifth act and the beginning of the fifth act, but we don't have the middle. And as, as people who are now improvising and trying to uh, like uh, perform in a way that that is aligned with the first four acts and beginning into the fifth, um, it requires us to immerse ourselves in the other acts so that we might improvise faithfully. Right. And he says, well, that's, you know, we have the, we have the creation story, the fall story, the Israel story, the Jesus story, and now we live in the church story. That's the beginning of the fifth act and the end of the fifth act. But we don't know how to improvise faithfully in the meantime. Yeah, because so the we Bible's take goal. What we've learned from the first four acts. Yes. To infer how we improvise during this fifth. Correct. And why? Why would he do that? So that we would participate. Yeah. I. In, yeah. This is just a, opens up so much wonder. And then I to affirm you the fact that you the girl felt comfortable enough to come up and ask you like we're in a time period now we're watching john MacArthur create oh boy mess after mess after mess right and he's Mm -hmm. arguably kind of like i don't know i mean his his study bible i feel like he's kind of like the american pastor to a certain degree right like he was of a certain generation absolutely for a long time but as we're watching him shut down conversation and uh kind of protect sexual abuse for sake of the church and whatever, but to see a church where um, the conversation is more important than her just walking out with you saying, this is how you do it. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, it, I yeah. think, I feel like that is more in line with what you just described from Jesus's, the way that Jesus presented things, this idea of improv, all that kind of stuff to say, Hey, you know, it was the reading rainbow. Don't take my word for it. Like, you know, invite yeah. people into the conversation and invite them into the debate and invite them into the the messiness of it. That's and right. that seems to be more kind of what the script is here than yeah. Yeah. these other versions that we've kind of seen. Yeah. Well, it's just so, so if somebody came up to you and said, hey, should I get married? Tell me about, <laughs> tell me what marriage is like. Right. <laughs> How could you ever describe? I mean, but we did that too. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, how could you ever describe it? Yeah, you you would be you would be, uh, you know. That's actually such a great metaphor because growing up in youth group, that is exactly what happened. 
You will huh. wait to have sex until you're married, and this is what marriage will be like. And right. then we got married, and we were like, what the crap? This is not what I was sold. Out. Right. And it actually involve, it actually does involve so much of uh, participation and listening and yes. going forward forever. And you don't have to have a good marriage. No, no. one's ma- no one makes you. Yeah. But but if you are determined to have one, then the cost of participation is high. Yeah. Totally. And um and I don't know. I, I just see similarities behind this idea of a Jesus who invites us to return into the full image bearing that we're designed for. There's a lot of pain and mystery and wrestling. And how could you describe it to anyone? You know, that's where that's where the he gets us or there's a hole in my heart. Or it's like, how would you do an ad for marriage that says, hey, would it be great to have someone hold your hand when you die? In 30 seconds. And, and, and the answer is like, well, yeah, that's true. But how you get there right. is <laughs> the most painful and ridiculous you know, set of circumstances um, well, it's weird. and the, work. The just doing the holding the hand while you die thing is counterintuitive than to um, actually getting to the point where someone is holding your hand when you die because you're skipping all yeah. the stuff, and then instead you're setting up a precedent that people can't meet because they don't understand how to. So it becomes That's counterintuitive right. because it's the opposite of what totally. the outcome would look like. Yes. It's all very, yes, very is. interesting. I on the I put out the other wanderer thing with Amazing Grace, and I was trying Thank to you. parse. I was trying to think about grace, and and I don't know how, if I did it well or not. But the idea of like with the slave trade stuff and John Newton, and mm-hmm. understanding that if G, if God and Jesus are trying to rehabilitate or uh, you know re give us what is the word humanity, like trying to Renew? Restore? Renew humanity. Man, I knew I start with re. Re-re. <laughs> refurbish? Uh, refurbish humanity. Um, and part of that is saying, hey, that, you know, in denigrating your fellow human with slavery and that kind of stuff, that God's grace is showing John Newton that that was an incorrect way to live with other people. Mm-hmm. And he had to respond to this idea and understand what it meant to lean in and know that it was God's grace to say, Hey, you're doing this wrong. You're, Mm. you're not being a human correctly and you're hurting other humans and how you're doing it. And so he learns from that and he changes the way that he does things and becomes an abolitionist. But in some ways I saw God's grace as being a revelation of saying, Hey, this is not how you do it. And, and then you have to lean really hard into that to change the culture around it. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting. And it's what a cool thing for us to be a part of. Right. To say, no, this is not it. We're, we're meant right. for so much more than this. Switch right. foot. <laughs> well, we'll end it there, man. Holy moly. Good stuff, <laughs> Timothy. Um, hey, friends, thank you. Thanks for being so great. Thanks for letting us be a part of your life. Hope this is helpful. Um, smash that subscribe button. I always want to say that now. And we're on YouTube. It's glorious. Take care, friends. (laughs) See ya.